and welcome to NCIA's Industry Essentials Educational Webinar Series, our premier digital platform featuring a variety of programs to provide you timely, engaging, and essential education when and where you need it most. My name is Brian Gilbert, the Deputy Director here at NCIA, of Events here at NCIA, and I'm very excited to welcome you all to a very special year-end edition of our Service Solutions Series today, presented by the team at Series Greenhouse Solutions. If you're just joining us, please stay on the lookout for housekeeping and orientation instructions to be relayed via the chat window, so we're not taking up any more valuable time with routine info. But if you have any questions for your team on how to participate in this virtual event, please message myself or my colleague Brooke Gilbert at any time via a private message inside the Zoom chat room. Now, let's get this show on the road. Whether you're a grower, builder, investor, member of the cannabis industry at large, or someone who is just interested in the future of cannabis cultivation technologies, this webinar is for you. Entitled Coming Out of the Dark Ages, The Future of Controlled Environment Agriculture and Sealed Greenhouse Cultivation, our program today will highlight some of the important technologies involved in modern greenhouse design, as well as Series Greenhouse Solutions' unique approach to facilitating cultivation to market strategies for those looking to enter this world of cannabis growth. We have a lot of information to cover and a very important topic to explore, so let's not waste any more time. To kick things off, I'd like to welcome our panelists to the virtual stage. Before we get started, I'll let the audience know a little bit more about each of your own backgrounds and expertise before turning it over to Josh to kick things off. First off, we have Josh Holub, the co-founder and co-owner of Series Greenhouse Solutions. Since starting at Series seven years ago, Josh has created the Cannabis Division, bringing his more than a decade of experience in both construction, cultivation, and dispensary management to the fold. Josh approaches his job with an interdisciplinary understanding of systems, architectural design, and problem solving, and his goal is to create a whole systems approach to both design, greenhouse design, and environmental controls, resulting in the most efficient systems and highest quality product. He was featured in Marijuana Venture Magazine as one of their 40 under 40 rising stars in the cannabis industry in 2018. Welcome, Josh. Thank you. Next up, we have Sonny Kircher who works in commercial design and sales for Series Greenhouse Solutions. Sonny is a strong advocate for making existing industries more sustainable, specifically by looking at closed loop system design, encouraging internal innovation and mimicking natural systems. Between growing plants, outdoor pursuits and studying environmental design, she has recognized the crucial role of environment or of ecosystem dynamics to the health of any community. Her background includes environmental policy, soil and rangeland ecology, GIS mapping, urban planning, food systems, and supply chain management. All right, we've primed our participants with the background they need before diving into the program. So why don't you take it away from here, Josh? Sure, thanks, Brian. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to Coming Out of the Dark Ages, the Future of Controlled Environment Agriculture in Sealed Greenhouse Cultivation. Uh, my name is Josh Holub with Series Greenhouse Solutions, and I'm here with Sunny Kircher. Hi, Sunny. Hey. Thanks, Josh. Uh, and I've been with Series for about nine years since the beginning. Um, we are an R&D engineering and manufacturing company that designs and supplies greenhouses. Um, to cannabis growers, as well as commercial ag growers um, and recreational growers. Um, our goal has always been to provide the most efficient and most effective growing space available. Um, and our timing just worked out well with cannabis. And while both Sunny and I have a background in cannabis other than this, um, Ceres has just evolved along with the cannabis industry um, to what we believe is a, a really great solution and probably the future of commercial cultivation in the cannabis industry. Um, we want to say thanks to Brian and NCIA for the opportunity to, to speak. And we want to thank all of you for taking the hour to listen. Sounds like we have people from all over the world, which is pretty fun. Um, we've been working internationally. And so hopefully this is relevant to everybody that we're talking to. Um, Cannabis started as an indoor growing thing. It was an underground product. Um, what we're seeing now is innovation finally starting to take hold. Um, we are leaving the indoor grow room. We call this coming out of the dark ages. 
Um, HPS lamps are slowly going away. Indoor grows are starting growing, starting to go away. Um, this conversation is going to be about what is coming, what we're working on, um, what we're currently offering, what we hope to be offering in the future, and why um, for the grower, for the uh, for the business itself, why this makes sense. Um, so this is for business people. This is for cultivators, policy people, engineering folks. Um, we hope there will be something relevant for everybody in this conversation. Um, and we also, we have this chat box. So feel free to ask questions as we go. We'll try and monitor as best we can and answer those, tie them into the, to the talk as best we can. And then we'll have some time at the end for a Q and A session if we didn't get to you during the talk itself. All right, I'm just gonna assume you're all like smiling and nodding your heads yes, and we'll just get into this thing. Um, so what is greenhouse CEA is the first question. CEA is controlled environment agriculture. It is a combination of engineering, plant science, and computer managed greenhouse control technologies for optimization of plant growing systems, plant quality, and production efficiency. What we are trying to do is combine farming and a laboratory is really what it comes down to. Um, we are growing plants. Uh, we get so we get so deep into engineering and buildings and systems, and we often have to step back and say, okay, we're growing plants. And what do the plants want? The plants want sunlight, really. You know, and we're trying to give them that the best way that we can, which was lighting, and still has a lot to do with lighting. But sunlight is really the goal. Um, what we also know is that cultivators are used to controlling the environment. This is a high quality crop. Indoor grows allow for very precise environmental controls. And that is something that growers are demanding and, and for good reason. And so where we are with CEA is trying to combine the sunlight, which is free, with the controlled environment that the grower wants, the plant wants, and the business operator needs. Um, CEA is a fairly established field of study. Um, the fact that cannabis is now a pretty large industry means that there's more money for research and we're gonna be learning more and more as time goes on. But there are major CEA study centers in the US, uh, University of Arizona in Tucson has a biosphere and a whole program. Um, Cornell University does a bunch of work with CEA. And so this isn't, um, this isn't a, a new technology. There's a lot of new things that are coming with new um, products that are available, but this is something studied and fairly well understood, even though there's still a lot to learn. Stunny. Brian, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you, Josh and Brian, uh, for getting things started. So as Josh said, plants are at the core of this industry, right? No matter why you're here, what your background is, you're somehow working um, with or near the cannabis plant, right? It's a part of um, your interest. And so we're going to begin by just doing a, a quick overview of like the plant science component of CEA. And this will probably take some of you back to high school biology for a moment, but uh, I think it's always good to review the basics and make sure that we're all on the same page and build upon that. So starting with a very uh, molecular uh, component of all of this is the photosynthesis, um, which directly translates to plant growth. So, you know, imagine if I'm a plant, um, I literally am taking in carbon dioxide from the air around me. I mean, today I'm in outer space, so there's not a lot of carbon dioxide, but <laughs> on a normal day on, on planet Earth and water coming up through my roots and combining that with photons from the sunlight or wherever the source of light is around. And that um, through the miracle of photosynthesis um, converts to, simple sugars, glucose, and oxygen. And so this chemical reaction is has been around for a very long time and it's not changing. And a big part of CEA is to understand this and recognize how you can control the variables that lead to photosynthesis. Because when a plant is photosynthesizing, it's growing um, either um, in size or going into a flowering stage and producing product uh, for the industry. And so, um, yeah, that's just a quick overview of 
um, the fundamental level of CEA is plant growth. And so um, you can see in this, um, this diagram that we have right here on the left, um, we've got a small plant growing in the middle and all of these external components, the variables that, that you can begin to control in CEA. So um, with that, I will pass it back to Josh. Uh, Brian, you can go to the next slide. So the first thing that we think about of many, and we'll get we'll get into all of them, but the first thing that we're thinking about with cannabis production is is light. Um, when we started in Colorado, which is where we're based, um, you could not grow in a greenhouse or outdoors. It was indoor cultivation only. And the industry was formed around that. That became the standard. It had been the stary, the, the standard um, before cannabis was, a, was legal to cultivate anyways. Um, now we can use the sun. The sun obviously is the cheapest source of light for our plants. It is. It has the spectrum that the plants want, or at least wanted. Some might argue they've been bred to, to use what they're used to now, but we would always say that still the sun is it. It has UV light. Um, and so our goal, which is for highest quality, highest yield, lowest operating costs, is to utilize the sun as much as we possibly can. Um, we are looking at a lot of things when we're looking at light. I also want to say that this isn't only sun. When we design a proper cultivation facility, there is a full LED lighting system that can accommodate whatever the cultivator's minimum PPFD level is or DLI level that they want on a daily basis. So even on the shortest day in the middle of the winter with no sun, we can always hit that minimum light level. Um, you can see on the little chart that we've got a, a few things that we're taking into consideration when we're, when we're thinking about light. Um, DLI is a daily lighting integral. This is the accumulation of the amount of light that the plants have seen throughout the day. When we are laying out lighting strategies for a, a, a cannabis greenhouse, we're usually trying to hit between 40 and 45 DLI per day. Um, what we do then is we can calculate how much the sun is giving us in the middle of summer on a sunny day. It might be all sun the whole day. And in the winter, it might be a third sun and two thirds supplemental lighting. But regardless, we're going to hit that minimum DLI level. Um, what DLI level, what the DLI is taking into account is intensity of the light. Um, it, it, duration, obviously, we control with a light depth system or by adding light in the winter. We're in the winter months now, so we're often adding three hours of light in the morning, three hours of light in the evening, and hoping that the sun's giving us enough, enough in the middle of the day and dimming lights up and down throughout the day as needed to make sure we're hitting our levels. Um, and then what we lay these things out with is PPFD, which is photosynthetic photon flux density. This is micromoles per meter per meter squared per second. It's how much light is hitting a square meter per second. So we can control lights based off PPFD where they're always getting whatever you, your minimum is, 700 PPFD, 900 PPFD for a full 12 hour spectrum, whether that's sun or lights, they're gonna get it. Or we can use DLI, which says, okay, we've hit 40 DLI for the day. It's 5 PM, we have two more hours of the photo period. So let's dim down the lights because we don't actually need the intensity right now, but we need the duration. Or if we have a light that adjusts spectrum, let's go red with the lights. It's the most efficient way to use the lights. It keeps them in the photo period, but they don't need the intensity. And so with our controller, we can play with lighting in that way to optimize yield, optimize quality and minimize input expenses. Okay. Next slide. The next thing, and, and probably other than sunlight, the most exciting thing um, for me personally is controlling the environment of the greenhouse. So now we're letting sunlight in. The greenhouse is warming. It's just something that happens with sunlight. Um, infrared light is coming in and the greenhouse is warming. Even on the coldest day, we're in Colorado, it could be 10 degrees outside Fahrenheit, um, it could be zero. We still need to cool the greenhouse. 
The sun warms it. These are highly sealed, insulated greenhouses. We need to cool the greenhouse. Um, and there are also you know, times when it's gray and we have to heat the greenhouses. So how do we do it? And how do we do it efficiently and effectively? We base our controls on vapor pressure deficit. Um, some people know what this is, some don't. Vapor pressure deficit is the ratio of temperature to humidity that actually creates a pressure um, in kilopascals that, that allows the plants the optimum conditions to uptake nutrients and, and transpire. So basically what we're trying to create is an ideal environment for the plants to move the nutrients that you're trying to feed them so that they grow faster, so that they have higher quality um, flower. Um, and then we try and do it in the most efficient way possible. So traditionally in an indoor greenhouse, we're trying to be at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 50% humidity or something like that. And we wanna lock it down. Um, the issue with that in a greenhouse is that the sun's out, it's August in the Northern hemisphere, it's a hot summer day. It is very expensive, both in infrastructure and operating cost to keep a greenhouse at 75 degrees. And with the vapor pressure deficit controls, it's not necessary. So we can let the grower choose what they think a high pressure is or a high temperature can be. Um, we usually start around 84. I think we have growers who will let it run up to 88 once they learn the system, but we take humidity with it depending on stage of growth with the plant. Um, so instead of cooling, we can actually let it warm and using a high pressure fogging system, which is part of our system, we can actually bring humidity up with it. You can see in the chart when we're flowering, we're in yellow. Um, as we let the temperatures warm, which is as, as the yellow dives to the bottom right, we can just increase humidity with it um, to stay in our yellow band. Um, obviously when you have big flowers on the plant, we're not gonna let it run up to 70% humidity. So at that point we will start cooling and we'll keep the humidity low either by not adding fog or by dehumidifying. Um, but for the first few weeks of flower, if not the first you know, four weeks of flower, whatever the cultivator feels comfortable with, we can significantly reduce um, operating costs with cooling. Um, yeah, Sunny. All right, so going underground, which I find one of the more exciting components of CEA, um, but really it's all about how it ties together. It's not any one component or variable here. Um, so nutrients and water, um, also essential to plant growth. Uh, if you have everything above ground perfect, you know, you have that perfect VPD, the perfect PPFD, your plant still is not going to grow if it doesn't have water or the right amount of nutrients for that given time. And so, um, like we've been saying, it's a balance of all these different variables to lead to um, plant health. And so determining, you know, there's no one right way to set your nutrients or your, your watering schedule in any cultivation. The first thing you want to look at is what is your growth style and what makes sense? You know, are you growing in soil, hydroponics, aeroponics, or some combination of those. And a good way that I like to tell people um, to make that decision is actually looking outside of the facility and seeing what you have available on site. Um, are you in an area where you don't have a lot of water, um, perhaps in Arizona, uh, Nevada, et cetera, where it makes sense to choose a growth style that's going to be um, you know, light on your water usage, um, such as aeroponics or hydroponics, um, or a very different climate, say you're in Michigan and you have plenty of water, but not as much sunlight, or um, you're in a more rural area and um, access to power um, through the utility is actually the limiting factor. So these are kind of some of the approaches to thinking on making a decision about what growth style will make the most sense for your cultivation. Um, so another component too, um, once you're inside the facility, um, is the stage of the plant cycle, right? You're going to be watering and feeding different nutrients depending on what stage of growth you're in. The same with light. Um, so you can think of these as recipes um, that you're combining with the, the set points on the VPD and um, the PPFD as well. 
Um, and so uh, this graphic that we have here um, on the right is one of our facilities and on the upper left part is the head house. And uh, I wanna just take you through a tour really quick following that dark blue line um, on the, the right side, it's in the water treatment room. And then once that water gets treated, whoops, um, it's going over to the other F and um, light blue is where it becomes fertigated. So you're adding whatever nutrients and supplements you want and distributing that into the different grow rooms. So flowering in the greenhouses and then mothers and clone in the head house. Um, and so these, you know, we're looking at the input side of things. Um, all water for the most part is going to be taken up through the root system. A very small percentage um, of nutrients can also be taken up through uh, through the leaves. But, you know, so we're beginning by inventorying our resources here. Um, and as the plant is growing, right, it's taking up those water and nutrients and up to 90% of it is released through a process called transpiration. So. Um, the plant is quite literally exhaling water vapor out of its leaves. And where does that go? Um, what we do is we recapture that water through the condensate. So um, that's where that, uh, let's call it teal color is. Um, that water is being recaptured and sent back to the water treatment room to be reused. And the, the lighter green is the effluent. So any runoff water coming out of the plants or rather out of the media um, that the plants didn't take up. And so, you know, the beautiful thing about this diagram is it really is, it's a closed loop system. None of that water is really, it's leaving the facility except for when, once it's been taken up into biomass. So we have a really low um, water usage and it's being used really efficiently. Um, and so, you know, the other, the other point here, one more thing, Brian, is how do, how do we monitor things like this to um, optimize the, the performance of the facility and the growth of the, of the plant? Oops, I hope my audio is coming in okay. I'm gonna say this last thing and then I'll figure it out. Um, so we have soil moisture meters is one way. So actually measuring the moisture in the soil to determine if the plant is taking it up. Um, and sap flow is uh, an, another uh, metric that we can read, um, also known as bricks. So it's the content of the sugar and the movement inside of the plant once it's taken up the water and nutrients. So there's all sorts of ways to monitor how the water is moving, how quickly, and if it's being used efficiently. So that's a quick overview. I'll hand it off to the next slide. And just so you know, Sonny, your audio seems to have corrected itself. It might've just been a bandwidth issue on my end. So sorry for the distractions. Good, hope everyone could hear me. Perfect. All right. So the next thing in the environment is um, airflow and CO2. So traditionally um, any grow room is going to have some sort of air circulation, whether it's oscillating fans, um, moving air and creating a gentle breeze on the plants or in a greenhouse, um, horizontal focused fans. Um, in our greenhouses, we're, we're putting our heat cool in through the north wall of the greenhouse, all of it. And then we use a half fan to circulate the air. It's fairly standard. Um, a newer technology that's being used, we use it, most do, is a de-stratification fan. So in a greenhouse, especially because there's sunlight um, during the day and potentially cold temps at night where the roof is actually much colder than you would ever see in a indoor cultivation room, um, the air will uh, stratify. So heat obviously rises, which means you could have a cool zone in your plants, which is our, our focus is the plant zone. We don't really care what's happening up top. Um, De-strap fans, blow directly down. Um, there's a few manufacturers that we like that make the fans, but the idea is as heat rises, we are moving that air back down to the ground, especially in the winter when heating and consistency and temperature is the most important. Um, in the summer, if it's hot out, we may or may not have the, the D-strap fans on. They're controllable with a whole house controller. Um, 
And depending on the environment in the greenhouse, they may or may not be used. Um, so we have airflow moving horizontally in the greenhouse and we have airflow moving vertically in the greenhouse, um, which creates a fairly consistent um, temperature and humidity ratio along with CO2 throughout the whole greenhouse, which is really important, um, helps with consistency. Um, as you can see in this graphic, the other thing that we do, and, and, and this is something that we'll begin to see more and more of, is we can control the pressure in the rooms of the greenhouses, not just the greenhouse, but the whole facility. Um, in Europe and in Canada as well, um, while the, the terminology isn't always the same, um, GMP, which is good manufacturing practices, and GACP, which is good, um, good agriculture and collection practices, um, are keywords for design. Um, facilities have to be designed um, to a certain spec um, to be able to recreate the same outcome over and over. Um, and so what we can do through the HVAC system is create pressures in certain rooms, higher pressure in some, lower pressure in others, to manage airflow. Um, in, the, in the diagram you're seeing, what we've done in this building is veg rooms on the east side and west side of the head house, which is the, the, the rectangle on the top of the picture. We, that's the north side for us. Those veg rooms, plants flow down both exterior hallways towards the south, through the greenhouses, and then harvest, you go back up the central corridor. We encourage cultivators and staff to always flow in that direction. What that means is that if we know where a pathogen may be, and we know that it won't get from one greenhouse to the next greenhouse, unless there's some kind of user error. We also know that when we harvest the plants, the central corridor might, might be exposed and we know to clean it. So through airflow, um, we can help minimize pest or mold mildew um, issues. The other, the other important thing to think about here is CO2. Um, CO2 is commonplace, you know, studies show up to 30% more yield. Um, and most commercial growers, especially indoor, are using it. A vented greenhouse, you really can't use CO2 um, supplementation in the summer, at least, because you're using um, ambient exterior air as you're cooling. And so you're moving a lot of air through the greenhouse. Um, if you were supplementing CO2, you're really just exhausting it out, out the fans and it's not um, effective. In, in our case, not only is CO2 food for the plants, um, but it also makes the plants more, spout, more stout. Um, plants can handle higher temps, more stress in general in a CO2 rich environment. And not that we're stressing the plants, um, but it, it is a bit of a safety measure for the plants and for your entire cultivation facility. Um, we also use um, a modulating CO2 valve. Um, it's not just on or off any longer. It's open a little bit. It's open a lot, depending on what we need. And when we look at a graph of CO2 in a greenhouse, traditionally it, it's up and down, zigzag, high, low, high, low, and that's open, close. What we can do is create a almost totally straight line across the board. It can be at whatever 1200, 1500 PPM all day long. Um, that's consistent for your plants. That means you're not wasting any CO2. You're being very precise with it, um, which is part of our goal is getting the plants what they need in the most efficient way possible. All right, next slide. All right, perfect. And I got to swap one setting real fast just to get this optimized for our video real quick. So give me one moment. Got a nice little intermission that the series team got us queued up here. All right. Okay. Being high tech, you know, we couldn't help but <laughs> bring in some more here. All right, perfect. Are we ready to queue the video up for you all? Yeah, go for it. All right, let's rock and roll. Hey! 
God, here we go. Of course it won't open. That door won't open again for an entire year. Nothing comes in, nothing goes out, not even air. It'd take a Sherman tank to open that door. Hmm. Mm. So what you're saying is... You can't get out. We're stuck here. Yes. For 12 months. That's right. 12 months? 52 weeks. Yes. 385 days? Yes. 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 So what you're really trying to say is... Oh, sorry about that. Apologies, everybody. Looked like we didn't have the video queued up. Give me one split second. All right, you all see the screen share now? Yes. All right, let's rock and roll. Sorry about that. Hey! There's no doubt here! Oh, God, here we go. Olivia, what's with this door? It's not open. Of course it won't open. That door won't open again for an entire year. Nothing comes in, nothing goes out, not even air. It'd take a Sherman tank to open that door. Hmm. Mm. So what you're saying is... You can't get out. We're stuck here. Yes. For 12 months. That's right. 12 months? 52 weeks. Yes. 385 days? Yes. 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 So what you're really trying to say is... Some old biodome going on in there. All right, you all can pick it up right from here. Thanks so much. Yeah, just a little comedic relief. I know we're hitting you guys with a lot of science and technical info. So um, highly encourage you to see that movie if if you're in for some 90s slapstick humor. And it is based on actually a real project, the Biosphere Project um, in Arizona. So it's a sealed greenhouse, quite literally. They're stuck in there. Um, so, you know, we've really gone deep into a lot of these variables here. Now we're going to transition in a little bit about how they relate to each other and how we are um, really making the CEA, CEA come to life. So um, ecology, first of all, is the study of relationships. So it's not about, you know, biology, you're studying life, chemistry, you're studying compounds, um, and ecology, you're studying the relationships. And that is a lot of what we're doing at series and what happens in CEA when you fiddle with one variable, how is that going to affect all of the others? And you can really get into the fun stuff when you change two variables um, and see how that affects plant health. Um, and so the overall goal of it is really to optimize performance and plant health. Um, and so some examples of how we could do this in the in the greenhouse facility is, you know, using light fixtures as a heat source. So this would be really with HPS lights, not LEDs, but that, oops, I'm still on here. Yeah, you're good. I was just getting the screen share reoriented. Sorry about that, Sonny. Okay, sorry. Um, so, you know, if, if you chose to use HPS lights in your cultivation, they also have a high BTU heat output. And so that would be considered in sizing HVAC systems that, um, you know, looking at lighting schedules of when those lights are on and when you will be heating the facility. So um, a second example would be to use fogging as stage one cooling. So, um, I think that we think a lot about dehumidification in grow environments, but humidification is also real. You know, if, if the environment is too dry, then the, the plants are not gonna be growing um, to their optimum health. And so we can use fogging as stage one cooling as well as a way to increase the humidification. So the, the point of this example is that certain systems can be used for multiple purposes, not just one. Um, so next slide, and we'll talk a little bit about how we can control them. So what, what we're doing here is just 
going through um, what controls have looked like over the years. Um, well, I've never used it. I'm sure that some people did used to plug in or turn on their lights at seven in the morning and turn them off at seven in the evening. Um, early on, um, we were all using um, timers to control our lights. And usually, I know in my case, I was there to make sure the lights were on in the morning and to make sure they were off in the evening because the $20 timer had a pretty critical role um, in my overall growth. Um, we've evolved somewhat into light sensors um, where now we can see what's going on with lights. Um, we can tell the spectrum. We can see how powerful the lights are. We know that when the sun's out, our light reader um, tops out at 2200 PPFD. And in the greenhouse that I'm in right now, um, any sunny day for almost all the year, we will max out um, in at least the middle of the day, if not most of the day, with that PPFD level. Um, I can't see how high it is because my reader doesn't go that high. And then the next stage, which is what Sonny was just talking about, is the smart integrated control. Um, the idea here being that all systems are talking to each other through one through one channel um, to optimize the grow and make it as efficient as possible while still providing all the set points that you're after. Um, it gives us the ability to be quite precise while being very efficient. Um, we see this with some of our earlier greenhouses before we offered the smart controls. Um, I'll walk into a, a, a grow room indoor or even some of our greenhouses and the dehues will be running and they're running on a humidistat and the foggers also running at the same time. Um, that is bad on a lot of levels, but mostly your plants are probably a little bit confused and you're wasting a lot of energy. Um, and that is basically stands against everything that we're trying to do here. Um, also what Sunny talked about with water flow we used to just, you know, traditionally, not series, but growers in general, um, you know, we'd crank water through an RO to, to get into the, the storage tanks so that we're, we're ready to use it. Um, meanwhile, our dehues are doing whatever, 200 pints a day, um, and we're draining that out into the sewer system. That is, that is um, distilled water. It's basically RO water and we're just setting it out, but we're using a pump to press water through a membrane, costs us money to make that. What we do is we capture our dehu water, we send it back to the head house, water pump is low energy. Um, we do refilter it, not through an RO, but we kill biologicals, whether that's with ozone or with a UV light, and we reuse that water. We're now water efficient, so we're not paying for water, um, nor are we paying to use the RO system, which requires high pressure and can be expensive and you need membranes and all that. So we end up with the same outcome, um, but with much less input. Um, with the control side of thing, with um, the environment, heat, cool, um, sometimes instead of dehumidifying, we can heat. So the warmer air is, the more moisture it can hold. So with the same amount of moisture, as air gets warmer, the relative humidity decreases. So it is basically a dehumidification process, but heating can be cheaper, is cheaper than dehumidification. Heating is heat into the air. Dehumidification is a major cooling down to the dew point and then a reheat to get the air back to in, inside room temp and then you let it back in the room. So instead of dehumidifying, we can heat if it's within our range of where we're comfortable with our plants living in um, to maintain VPD. So those are really cool little ways where it's not, nothing is rocket science here, but it's an idea of what are we trying to create? And then what is the best way to do that? And on the, on the end, when, when a grow, when a, when a cycle is complete and we've harvested, we can now look back through our smart controller at all the data, um, how the lights dimmed up and down, um, 
how much dehue we were using, uh, heating costs, cooling costs, and we can compare that to yield, uh, strain and yield. If we like what we saw, next time we're growing that strain, we can just click run that same program, you know, eight weeks, nine weeks, whatever it is, run it, and it will run it. Or we can start tweaking things. Um, we can say, let's use that red, red spectrum only if we've hit DLI, but we need to maintain photo period uh, in this one. And let's see what that does to yield and quality when we're done. And let's see how much more efficient that makes us. Um, we can fog more, we can fog less, um, and we can start making these little tweaks, compare it to the output, and then begin to really get good uh, at optimizing our grow. Um, because in the end, the name of the game here is efficiency. Um, we think a lot about cost per gram. Um, because as cannabis normalizes, and we've seen it, prices have come down and down. They're, they're fairly stable now, um, especially in established markets. Um, but knowing that you can be operational um, and profitable at whatever, 500 a pound, 800 a pound, is reassuring, especially when you're, you know, you, the market rate's 1500 a pound. Um, but knowing that you can do that where others can't is a good business position to be in. All right. So you're probably thinking, this is a no brainer. This is amazing. How, how do I do this? Um, it looks like the, um, the, oh, there it is, the image. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we actually go through the design process uh, for creating a sealed greenhouse um, facility and using CEA. Uh, time is a major component for our approach to design. And I'm not just talking about speed, like how fast can I make this happen? But being able to look back at market and industry trends, as well as making educated assumptions about what is coming. So, you know, one perspective is what kind of product do I want to grow? Am I growing a plant for high grade flower or for the edibles market or for extraction, et cetera. And so again, knowing your market um, based on location and um, the maturity per state or per region and, and knowing your um, consumers and your customers will really help determine that. And so these are the kind of conversations that we're having um, before we even dive into designing the HVAC system is, you know, what do you see, what's your vision and how is it gonna fit um, per place? And, you know, other components too are um, looking at your employees and what is the available labor force like, what is the skill set um, and the location of your, of your build. If you're in a really rural area, there, there's a good chance you won't have a lot of, of you know, uh, a labor pool to choose from. And so you might wanna go more automated versus if you are in a place where you have a team that's already trained that you are, wanna put into this facility, maybe you already have all your SOPs in place. And so kind of zooming out on the bigger picture of how to make these decisions for your facility and to have success is part of the holistic design approach. So, you know, this is a little bit beyond the scope of CEA, but it's very much relevant to the industry and, and your success um, is talking about the people and the market and why you're doing what you're doing. And so, you know, going back into that component of time, um, using existing templates as a starting point is something that we do as a design and engineering firm to accelerate the design process, at least having um, standards uh, that have already proven successful that we can use in, in your project if that's something that you would like. Um, QBD is a concept, it's quality by design. And going back to what Josh was saying about GMP and GACP, these certifications, um, quality by design is a way to approach those. Um, and basically you're just taking certain things into consideration with design. It's a, a systematic approach to product and process development. And the goal is to deliver a safe and um, 
also consistent product. And so this is especially more relevant for those who are working in either medical industries or preparing for export to have a really consistent product there. And eventually I think most people recognize this and especially, I know we have a lot of international attendees that um, you know, export is very much happening and on the horizon and uh, probably where the industry is going eventually. And so being able to deliver that product, uh, whether it be to meet a certification or even just to continue your brand loyalty and um, to, your, to your customers and clients is really important. Um, and so some of the things that we're looking at for QBD are um, employee workflow, uh, biosecurity, environmental consistency, which is really what we've been talking about this for most of this presentation, um, and then measurability and being efficient in the manufacturing process. And I'll, I'm just going to kind of combine these last three points here because I know we're getting close on time. But this is about how we go about the design process. It's not just one um, discipline, you know, it's not just series involved, but there's architects, civil engineers, maybe a landscape architect, et cetera. And so um, identifying, bringing that team together from the beginning um, is really crucial as well to have a successful uh, design process all the way through the building. Um, you want the, your facility built properly and quickly um, and then getting to market and making sure that it's um, operating just as it was designed. All right, next slide. Okay, and I believe our last slide um, is the business case for CEA. Um, so everything we've talked about is with the goal of having a, a, a viable business that makes you money, that is environmentally responsible, uh, happy employees, happy plants. Um, but there is a breakdown that when you look at this on paper, it needs to make sense as well. And, and we're asking for, you know, what, when you build something like this, it, it's not a small investment um, upfront. So my, my notes are a little funny here, but I'm going to start with um, energy efficiency rebates. Um, what we're learning is that because this is such a holistic system and because there's so much designed into it to reduce energy costs, that almost anywhere in the US that we build, and also we're learning in Canada as well, um, we are getting rebates from the power company um, and they can be significant. So we do that work on our end because it helps us to sell greenhouses, but also it's really important aspect of what we're doing is to prove that our design is actually reducing the operating costs like we say it is. Um, when you build a facility like this, um, you're reducing the need for chemicals, um, which allows for easier sales, higher quality product, lower operating costs. Now that's in labor and in materials. You have to buy the fungicides, pesticides. Um, and it also gives you a consistency where as a, as a business owner, you know that you're always going to have the consistent product to sell. You're never worried that you're going to lose a crop like you have potentially been in the past. Um, it gives you this peace of mind that we're dialed um, and, and we're going to have a harvest. Um, and some of our clients are even to the point where they can pre-sell harvests because over the past four or five years, they've been so consistent with quality um, that the people who are buying from them know it's coming and they know it's going to be good. And so they can pre-sell, which is really nice for the, from the business perspective. Um, the left side of this is an example of one of our clients. Um, in the end, the breakdown in gray is what's most important. Utility costs alone in our greenhouses, we're using only electricity. We're not actually using gas. Um, we have a geothermal system. Um, we are growing for utility costs, including lighting, heating, cooling, dehu of as little as two cents a gram. Um, it doesn't mean that we're not using, it, it's not all just power reduction. It's also increase in yield. Um, so we spend less, but we're growing more. And the combination of those two makes that cost per gram drop significantly. Whereas traditionally an indoor grow with HPS might've been 30 to 50 cents a gram. 
And here you can begin to see that at nine bucks a pound, utility inputs, um, and some of our clients are able to sell for above hotel, wholesale pricing because of the quality of the product, um, but let's call it 1500 a pound, um, you're in really good shape to have a stable business over time. And that's really our goal here. Um, in the end for the grower, you're cranking out indoor, indoor conditions with full sunlight. Um, you're getting the highest quality product on the market um, with full UV, which is good for terpenes, cannabinoids. Um, it's a mild stressor on the plants, which is beneficial. It also reduces pests. Um, and we're just, we're seeing happy customers growing a lot of product at minimal inputs, um, which is which is the goal of this whole conversation. And with that, I think we can wrap it up and move into some questions. Yeah, perfect. I've seen you do an amazing job engaging with the Q&A throughout the session, uh, Josh. So thank you for doing that. Um, so all of you all that had some burning questions, uh, we're going to transition to the Q&A portion of the event right now. We've got two open questions there. So even if you don't have a question to submit yourself, pop on over to the Q&A board, and give an upvote to any of those open questions that might be worthwhile. And while we're doing that, why don't we just dive right into a few? So yeah. um, we've got, uh, why don't we just respect chronology or chronology here? So let's go with Paul's question. Um, Paul asks, how much can humidity be reduced with a GAAT system that might hit the water table? Is yeah. it realistic to not require additional dehumidification with that system? Yeah, so we, we offer, uh, it's a GAHT system. It's the ground to air heat transfer. Um, and it is a, a low-tech geothermal system, um, internal air exchange. Um, it, is not, it is not capable of being your sole dehumidifier. Um, in commercial cannabis, we don't use the GAT system um, because we are going for more precision. Um, if it is warm in the greenhouse and cold outside, we can dehumidify with the GAT system, but it's not controllable the way most cannabis growers need it to be. Okay. Perfect. All right. Um, okay. We're just going to go down the line here. So we've got another question from Brian. Uh, I'm in a market that won't allow a South glazed wall for security purposes. I had the idea of building the head house on the first floor and sealed greenhouse in the second. Is this viable in your opinion? Um, it's a great question. Um, this greenhouse that I'm in actually um, also cannot have a South glazed wall. Um, and while this looks glazed, it's because this, this is one, and then there's another greenhouse here, they're connected, and then that solid wall over there. Um, from the design point of view, that's easy. A solid south wall is easy. What we do then is adjust our lighting. So now the south, south few rows of lights are gonna be their own zone. And we're gonna call that the winter, the winter lighting zone because you're gonna be casting some shadow on your farthest south plants in the winter when the sun is lower. Um, a rooftop greenhouse is possible, but at that point you get into very custom structures um, and costs start to accumulate. And so normally we would just say solid south wall, we can work with, the lighting is all reactive. So it doesn't turn on unless it's in the shade. It has a light sensor in that zone. Um, and so we'd say, let's just work with our lighting layout to make sure that in the winter you have lights on the plants and in the summer you're taking full advantage of the sunlight. Great. Awesome. Perfect. Okay, great. Thanks for all these awesome questions, everybody in the audience. Um, perfect. We've got one more open question from RDoc. Uh, please tell us more about CAPEX, if possible. And if that's an acronym, apologies. <laughs> um, CAPEX is capital expenditure, just, just to make sure everyone's aware. And RDoc, I believe you said in the beginning you're in Greece. Um, which is going to be slightly different because we actually have manufacturing in Northern Italy for our European clients. Um, in the US and Canada, on our end, and this is very rough numbers, we're seeing that our kit, the materials you're buying from series, this is unbuilt, um, is like in the 160 to $180 per square foot range. Now that is, soup to nuts. We're talking full greenhouse, light depth, LED lighting, smart controls, 
geothermal HVAC dehumidification system, high pressure fogging, um, um, bipolar ionization. You know, this is the this is the cream of the crop, uh, and then it has to be built as well. Um, it's hard. We try and help with estimating construction numbers, but it's quite difficult because a construction is out of control right now. I mean, everyone is so busy, and um, from place to place, North Dakota versus Southern California, you, you, it's wildly different. Um, and so while we can help with that in the actual design process, it's hard for us to say like here, hypothetically, what constructing it might cost. Fantastic. Well, that seems like a great question for a further follow-up conversation after the webinar. So um, definitely make use of the contact information that you see listed here. Um, Josh and Sonny would both be very interested in talking more about your needs surrounding any of the products or services that they've outlined today. Um, and it looks like we just got another question coming in right before the end of the hour. So I definitely don't want to uh, shortchange Paul here. So got another question from Paul. He asked, can you talk about your smallest starter greenhouse kit that we could build? And have you shipped any of those to Canada in the past? Yeah, so, um, you know, this, this is kind of a fun one. We have a greenhouse that's as small as, I actually don't know the east to west length because I don't deal with the little guys, but 11 foot by 16 foot or something. Uh -huh. um, it is not a cannabis specific greenhouse. It, it can't take light depth. Um, the smallest greenhouses that we can put light depth in are 18 foot north to south by whatever length east to west that you want. Um, and yes, we have um, hemp facilities in British Columbia. We just designed a um, cannabis facility in Quebec. We have commercial lettuce growers in Ottawa right now. Um, and so we work in Canada often. Um, they just very strange zip codes in Canada, letters and numbers, you know, it's confuses us. Oh, those always catch me when I'm searching my database. Um, perfect. Okay, great. So uh, we don't have any more questions um, right now. Um, we are going to transition into the outro of the event. So I'll give you, you know, 10, 15 seconds. If anybody has a burning question uh, at the top of their brain, uh, definitely want to make use of this live broadcast time to share those with the panelists. So we got any more questions, we'll get those in now. All right, not coming through. So um, while we transition back to final thoughts from both Josh and Sonny here, um, if you have any additional questions, pop them in there and we'll transition before going into the outro. Um, but if not, why don't I turn it back over to Josh and Sonny real quick to leave us with some final thoughts from today's program. I'll start. Um... You know, I, I don't think any project is too small or too big. And I think that series can help you. And if not, like you can find a way to succeed in this industry. And uh, the best way to do that is start by just, you know, evaluating what resources you have available um, on site or, um, you know, maybe it's financial and also just with your team. Um, what is it that you have and what is it that you need? And uh, do your research. There's a lot of good information out there. And um, yeah, I'll leave it with that. We'd love to hear from any of you. And thanks for joining us today and hope everyone has a happy holiday. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree with all of that. And, you know, our, one of our goals, our goals are happy plants. And, and one of our goals is happy uh, people working in the spaces um, and using sunlight however you can. Um, whether it's this or some other way, is really good for the plants, cheaper for operations, but it's good for the morale of, of the team. Um, and we see growers who've kept employees for years, which is pretty rare in the cannabis industry, because you're, you're farming again. And it's, it's really nice to be working in the sunlight. When it's dark, you're not working there. And, and so that's a really cool thing is to kind of bring it back to the sun and, and, and to, the, to the idea of farming, which is something that we, we really appreciate. Oh, perfect. We couldn't have ended the program with any other way than that. So um, fantastic. Well, thank you so much to Josh and Sonny for joining us today. Um, we're going to transition into the outro of the program. All of you all should have seen a final post-session survey just pop up on your screen. So please um, do submit your responses to that, letting us know if you'd be interested in us sharing contact information for any follow-up outreach by the series team, as well as if this presentation has changed your outlook on the cannabis cultivation process, and if you'd like to learn more about CEA. 
All right, perfect. Well, Josh and Sonny, you all can leave the virtual stage per se. And thank you all once again for presenting today's session. Um, we're really excited to have you all here and uh, we're gonna leave it with that. Um, as always, we're going to um, leave you all uh, with a our end of event credit sequence, highlighting all of the member businesses that participated in today's session. Um, so a huge thank you again to our panelists, our audience members and member businesses, which make our work possible. Special thanks once again to the series Greenhouse Solutions team for developing and presenting today's program. Uh, you'll all be directed to a post-event survey after the meeting room closes. Please make sure to complete this to provide us some really valuable feedback on your participation with the event. Um, and do note that all NCIA members will receive exclusive access to a formatted video recording uh, first posted in our members only community platform, NCIA Connect, and then stay on the lookout for the public webinar recording to be posted on our NCIA webinar archive at the cannabisindustry.org in the coming days as well. All right, and then I hope you all have a wonderful week. I look forward to seeing you all again next time for another NCIA Industry Essentials educational webinar. Um, we'll leave you with this end of event credit sequence highlighting the two dozen member businesses that participated in this afternoon's session. If you don't see yourself included, then you're one of the 50 non-member businesses that attended today. And we really hope that you'll consider joining today. Doing so will grant your team access to exclusive monthly members only webinars, as well as a number of additional benefits included in our membership. You can learn more and join now at thecannabisindustry.org. And with that, I hope you all have a wonderful end to your year. And I look forward to seeing you all again on the other side of 2020. See you next time.